Okay, good. It looks good. I had my the one from last week. Wow, I was so happy with that. I thought we did a nice presentation and everything last time, and it it didn't it didn't corrupt it. Now I went online and I found out that there's something wrong with uh, Macs. If you use a Mac with um, the video recorder on Photo Booth, which is what I was using, and it corrupts some uh, arbitrarily corrupts when saving, when ending, so that's what's been happening. So hopefully I use QuickTime that will work this better this time. If now, when you, you, I think maybe some of the other professors use the Teams thing to record. Does that record them visually or just audio? Just audio. Yeah, I don't want to deprive you of the pleasure of seeing what I wrote on the board. Ha, <laughs> ha, I like video. It's a little more interesting. Uh, plus, I, I don't know how to use Teams. I'm very, I, I, I know, it confuses me. I try to say, <laughs> stick to what I know. But, well. Uh, so we did, last time, learning theory. And it's, it, it's so amazing. I found these great videos online, these YouTube videos. And years ago, it, it, nothing like this. It would have been so difficult to find footage of B.F. Skinner presenting behavioral theory to, to, to you. And uh, and this interview with Albert Bandura and observational learning, I mean, the resources that are available today are just so amazing. And I, I honestly, I, I don't think I'm relevant. Like, why would you want to hear about behaviorism from me when you could hear it from B.F. Skinner? <laughs> you know, but, but it's about, but uh, B.F. Skinner can't answer questions. So I guess that's, you know, part of it. And it's, it's an interesting question, whether or not, I wonder what will happen to teaching professor, you know, college teaching. But, but you have these resources that are incredible that you would have to use to go, um, you know, go to a university library and try to find them and then sit there in a cubicle and have it loaded up to you by a librarian on, I don't know, VHS tape or before that, a film reel or something. I mean, this is amazing that uh, I, I, I miss a class and, and B.F. Skinner throws in for me, <laughs> which I can't let, hold a candle to him as far as behaviorism is concerned. So I hope, oh, oh also, I, you know, as it was brought to my attention, I, I, as is commonly the case, I mix dates up. <laughs> and your paper is now not due until when uh, the assignment that was it was supposed to be due whenever but yeah just yesterday but I made an error and it was a week ahead so it's not due till next week so you don't have to do it well I mean you have to do your assignment but you don't you won't have another one due until that one's submitted so enjoy that and and um, that's a that's an interesting little essay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Flater is doing research. Did, did, do you know about any of this? Did she mention it to any of you? So she's doing research, and as I had mentioned to you in our, uh, our chapter on research methods, Psychology 101 students are usually who are tapped into for research projects. So she and a colleague are writing a book chapter, and um, there, she's asked me to offer to you um, to do participate in this study, which I'll explain to you how to do. And what I would like to do um, is count it as an assignment. So you just do this, participate, document what I'm about to tell you how to do. And then when you give me this, the paperwork that you've done this, I'll give you an A on or what we'll call it, assignment, whatever the next number assignment is. We'll just count this as an assignment. Um, I think that's, I don't, I can't imagine anyone would be disagreeing to this. Maybe you want to hear what it involves first. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'll tell you what's going to happen. So it's a, it's a study on, what you think? So if we read this thing, it counts as, like a, as an assignment? If you do the, the, what I'm about to explain to you. It's the next. Yeah, we'll count it. I'll just give you a full credit on an assignment, if that's cool with everybody. Yep. Um, 
Oh, well, I better tell you what it entails first before you do that. First, you have to look around for cars that people have left their doors unlocked. And then when you find that, you have to break into the car. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it entails. It's a study in mindfulness. I'm doing comedy as my father would say. It's a, it's, it's a study in mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is kind of, um, it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of Buddhist psychology and cognitive psychology, cognitive therapy. And basically what you're going to do use is a technique that in, that teaches you how to pause and wait before reacting to an emotion. And I'm going to. And Dr. Flater has written out a, a method she would like you to use. And so basically, what you're going to do for the, her for as subjects is for the course of she says two weeks. Make sure, let me get her words exactly so I don't make any errors. She said, collect data. Um, give them two weeks to do this outside of the classroom and post in their journals. So for two weeks, I'm going to teach you firstly how to do this mindfulness technique exercise. It's very, she has a very, very effective and simple way to do this. There are many different ways of doing mindfulness meditation. But she gives you this mindfulness exercise and then she asks you simply, whenever you're going to encounter, um, maybe before cla a class where you might be nervous about taking, or maybe before taking a test, maybe before going out on the sports field for competition or something like this, Whenever you encounter something that's going to cause you a feeling of anxiety, um, to do this exercise. And then she, every time you do that, she'd like you to just mark down the date that you did it. And also, she would like you to describe the event. So tell her what, describe the event and persons around them. Um, Um, let me get this straight. Uh, students will be asked a couple times. So describe uh, for two weeks what they felt and they were able to, and, and they want to know, like, what was the activating event? I would do something like this. Uh, I tried to make a spreadsheet to give to you to fill out. That would make it very easy. And if you'd like, when I get home later or tomorrow, I can make one that you can print out. That, so, but, I'll, but if you just want to draw this up yourself, uh, I forgot how to use an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to do it. So well, I'll figure it out and make you one to print out if you want to use it. If not, just do this. Like maybe put the date here. Put a column with the date. So like, what's today? The 17th? You know, for if you want to start it today, do like 10, 17, 10, 18, 10, 19. Just do it for two weeks. You know, maybe you'll have a day that you do it. Uh, it, it you should, you know, do the exercise. And so here is, that's the day, and here is the, the event. So the event would go down this side, this side. So maybe let's say, I don't know, we have a class that has a port presentation. So you're going to say on 1017 class presentation. And do the, do the exercise. Uh, do this brief thing I'm going to teach you how to do, this little mindfulness meditation before the event, and then maybe write uh, a description of your experience. Did, it, did you feel more in control? Did you feel more calm? Were you calmer? Were you more in control? Did you feel, like, what were any phenomenological, you know, the word phenomenological, it's a self-observation. What were any descriptive things you want to share with how doing the exercise affected the event. 
And so she's asking for this to be two weeks. So I don't, I don't know. I would imagine you're probably going to do it. How many stressful events do you have? It depends on the individual. Maybe you get nervous going into the coffee shop or into the cafeteria. So that might be something. You might be do something that causes you anxiety every day. You might, do, you some of you might maybe have anxiety once or twice or three times in that period of week of a week. So I don't know how many entries you'll have. She doesn't. She doesn't say you have to do an entry every day. But let me read to you exactly from her words. She said. Days across the top, it might be easy to collect the data and chart it by putting days across the top and a description of use down the side. That's what she's suggesting. But maybe you just want to write a journal entry, a page of a description to let you know and collect your data that way. So she's not telling you exactly how to collect your data, just that you do the mindfulness exercise before some kind of anxiety activating event and then discuss how what you've seen that's different, if anything. In doing this, um, and she, again, she's doing this to for a book chapter that she's writing. The first exercise that will be taught is that of feeling calm. The student will need to first discuss or journal what makes them anxious. So spend a little time considering what it is in a week that makes you anxious. Is it coming to class? Maybe actually. There might be this moment, like when the class begins, and you walk into that door. Maybe you have anxiousness just walking into the classroom. Maybe you have anxiousness of walking in late. <laughs> and maybe the idea of being late may cause you anxiousness. Or maybe you're going to be taking a test or submitting your paper. Maybe the drive here causes you. Causes you. If I were doing this, I'm more nervous. Uh, I don't. I, I don't feel anxiety being here in front of the class with you, but I do feel anxiety when I'm concerned that I'm going to hit an unexpected situation driving here and not be here, miss, or come in late. That causes me anxiety. So maybe if I were participating in this study, I would meditate when I'd start to feel anxiousness about not making it on time and. See what kind of insights come up to that. Maybe some of you, it's when you're rehearsing, or um, sorry, at, you know, practice with your coaches in a sporting event, or maybe the actual game. Whatever it is that you find in your life, you make a list of these things that you become aware of moments that cause you anxiety. Maybe it's going into the cafeteria. I don't know. Um, the first exercise will be taught is that of feeling calm. The student will need to first journal and what makes them feel anxious. So write down a list of what things that make you feel anxious on a daily basis. How they feel when their anxiety and nerves starts to escalate. What, what is that experience? Introspect the phenomenology of the, what you mean by anxiety. Do you mean your heart races? Do you mean that you your legs get weak? Your knees get weak? Do you mean that you start sweating? Do you mean that you can't catch your breath? Uh, you know, do you find yourself trying to take a deep breath or sighing, or do you get some psychosomatic pains in your back or your headache? Uh, describe the event, the persons around you, the weather, your sleep state, your physical state, and all other information that might help you realize your unique, unique perspective on becoming uncalm. Try to look for those activating events and, and be, to be aware of these activating events. During class time, the students will be asked to reflect on being calm. So we can do that right now. Reflect on being calm. You will be instructed to close your eyes, take a deep cleansing breath. So you kind of breathe and take a deep breath and imagine it as a cleansing breath. Through your nose and out through your mouth. Now focus internally on the word calm. Your, your idea of the word calm. Close your eyes and just focus on this word calm and what that means to you. Uh, define the word. What do, think of what the word calm means to you. What does it feel like when you are calm? How would you describe the experience of being calm to someone 
that has never been calm. So these are all things to think about for yourself. What does calm mean, mean for you? And please think about a place that makes you feel calm. Do you all have that place in your mind? The place that makes you feel calm? I, my, my, uh, what I do, I, I think about being out beyond the breaks. When you paddle out and you surf, you go out beyond the breaks, like where the, before the waves break. It's a nice, the waves pass over, but it's deep and calm out there. And sometimes you paddle out and you're out beyond the breaks. You'll see surfers sometimes just sitting there. And you can spend hours just sitting there, and it's, it's, it's an amazingly calm situation because you're away from people. You're away from the things that happen on land. <laughs> you're out at sea, and it's a little bit like isolation in the, like maybe you feel in the woods or something, because you're out there and you're alone. The first time you do it, it's a little creepy because you don't know how deep it is. You don't know what's swimming beneath you. You don't know a lot of things. But then eventually it becomes, you realize this is like a, well, in my experience, it's this place of serenity where you, as soon as I paddle out past those waves, everything else in life ceases to exist. It's just right there then. So whatever that place is for you, maybe it's on the beach, laying in the sunny sand, maybe it's in the woods, maybe it's in your bedroom. So wherever that is for you, think about that place. What about this, quote, happy place makes you feel calm? So I just described to you a little bit what makes it, the reasons I think I feel calm. Plus water is very interesting. Is it the way it feels, the way it smells, the way it sounds? What makes you feel calm? Lastly, what is something that you do that makes you feel calm? Maybe running or taking a walk or laying in a hot bath or swimming uh, or taking a ride. Uh, what about this or that activity makes you feel calm? Feel the calmness come over your body and let calmness sink into your body. So interestingly enough, when you think about these places and these times that we that you find calm, it will your body will actually react to that thought and become calm just by being able to conjure up the place. Relax into the calmness and remember to take a deep breath in and out when you open your eyes. At the end of this exercise, the student will be asked to complete this activity outside the classroom and they begin to notice themselves getting anxious or nervous. So it's a pretty easy thing to remember, right? You remember, just go to your happy place. <laughs> it kind of sounds like something you hear on a sit on Frasier sitcom. Uh, but it's that's it. Go to this calm place, the place that you feel safe or secure. Close your eyes, go there mentally, and then go into your classroom or your sport event or your exam. Students will be asked to complete the activity prior to start and end the class, especially when there is going to be a quiz or a test. They'll be asked to journal for two weeks and discuss whether they felt they were able to be more in the moment after learning this skill. Is that pretty straightforward? Worth an assignment? Cool. So um, let's say today is which date? The 17th, if you start, start today. And we'll look at, do you want to hand them, hand me your papers? Do you want to, I guess, do it in handwriting or do you want to do it, type it out and Type it out is easier for you, I guess. Um, should we look on the 31st to give it, to hand it in? October 31st, give it to me. And then um, uh, and then I'll hand that over to Dr. Flader and she and I'll put a, your a, your paper and assignment grade in for full credit. Let me hand that in. All right, cool. You'll go through a lot of these. You'll be going through a lot of these uh, being a research participant over the years. And one day you'll be doing 
um, what do you call it? You'll be doing research and you'll be hoping that undergraduate students in your first year of freshman in each of the psych class, you'll be hoping that they did the study and participated. And then you know what you'll really be hoping for? That they didn't just write nonsense down, that it's real stuff that you can actually be useful for your research. So kind of, it's interesting, kind of try to think forward to the future you when you're conducting research and kind of look at this as paying it forward in advance to one day some student, you know, is going to be a first year freshman and then you're going to want to collect data and you're going to get data in and you're going to be looking at it and wondering, was this really data or did someone just fill out stuff to get their credit, you know, for doing it? It's interesting. One time, I, we, we had to do these, these uh, research projects. We had to participate in three research studies when I was in graduate school. And I had to have participated in one that was so involved, it was ridiculous. I'm, I'm talking about there was a questionnaire, and that questionnaire literally had uh, nearly 100 questions to answer. Now, who has time to sit down and fill out the answers to 100 questions? Now, do you know what we did? I mean, we're graduate school students. Do you know what we did? It was so ridiculous that we just went through every page and circled yes, no, yes, no. It was, you know, yes, no answers or a Likert scale, one to five, agree, disagree, that kind of thing on a scale. And it was so, it was so time consuming. And like yourselves, you know, you, you have very little time to do anything let alone go through a 100-page questionnaire. So we just went through and circled anything randomly, the whole class, and handed it in and got our research credit. The next semester, uh, the research, the, our research studies course was taught by a very well-known researcher who I was very privileged to study with. She said, how many of you participated in such and such a study last semester for, for credits to graduate? And you know, a few of us raised our hands and she said, what were your impressions of that study? And we all looked at each other and we didn't know exactly how honest to be, uh, but so she, she prodded us a little bit. She, she said, did any of you read every question and fill out the whole question? And we kind of looked at each other and we all shared our heads. No, it was ridiculous. It, was, it would have taken us hour to go through that whole thing. It was just too much. She looked at it, she said, good. She said, that graduate student who did that research deserved to fail. They should have known better than to do such a poorly designed research study. And that's something to keep into mind when you're doing these research, when you're doing, when you're developing your own research. Design your research in a way that will be more likely for a participant to take it seriously and not just fill in nonsense to, to, uh, to do that. Okay. So questions or thoughts about that? And you uh, can fill, both get a friend to fill you in on what happened there, or maybe the video will work and you can watch it and then you can't go through it again. Okay, so let's now turn to our chapter on memory. Um, memory. Do you remember last time we had a class together last lecture, we started off by doing a little bit of a historical overview of the, the, the school of thought of behaviorism. And if you recall, we said that behaviorism, that the starting year for this is 1913 with the Behaviorist Manifesto, which you all now are familiar with reading at least you know, the first few paragraphs of it and knowing that it exists and knowing the gist of it, John B. Watson, 1913. And we said that behaviorism was the way psychology was done through the 1960s. 
And then the idea was that psychology had lost its mind. There was no talk of consciousness. There was no talk of thought. There was no talk of mind. There was simply talk of um, stimulus and response. Empirical observation of behavior. Behavior. <laughs> That's it. That's all you can... The stimulus and the, and the responding behavior. It was called SR psychology. Stimulus response psychology. No discussion of anything that goes on in the mind because the mind is not observable nor is it measurable. Noam Chomsky, as you'll, as you'll learn... I'm sorry. B.F. Skinner, as you'll learn... Next semester, if you take my History of Psychology course, uh, B.F. Skinner wrote a book, and in this book he proposed that all human beings learn language through re reward and punishment schedules. Literally, that we all learn from our mother giving us food or comfort or you know letting us feed uh, all and giving us hugs and love that all of us learn language through these subtle rewards. So mama, oh, she said mama, and mommy hugs and tickles and loves mama. And again, mama, more reward, more attention, mama. And he proposed that all of us acquire language through a complex series of rewards and punishments. And he wrote a big book on this. And this is what psychologists, this is what the gospel through the 1960s, this is what psychologists learned, psychology students learned, and psychologists taught professors. And this was the word. This was the truth of the big T. Meanwhile, outside of psychology, there were a few people working in the Harvard, something new called the Harvard Cognition Lab. Now, the Harvard Cognition Lab was a place that was assembled with no psychologists. The Harvard Cognition Lab was a place that had people working, computer scientists, working on artificial intelligence. What is that? Well, you know what AI is today. This is around 1963, actually. Uh, artificial intelligence were computer scientists who were trying to write programs that mimicked how human beings thought. Artificial intelligence, AI, the Harvard Cognition Lab laboratory at Harvard University. One of the people at that Harvard Cognition Lab was a guy named George Miller. Also in Boston, at Boston University, was a guy named Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, still alive, and one of the uh, one of the foremost um, public intellectuals today. Noam Chomsky um, was, he's not a psychologist, he's a linguist. What's a linguist? Anyone know if you study linguistics what that means? Language. language, that's right, the study of language, linguistics. Just to give you an idea, the study of language is all about how does the word water that you hear in your ears and this graphic symbol come to signify something that you experience conceptually or sensorily. Remember, you can't drink the word water. <laughs> so how does this symbol, how do symbols in text take on meaning and how do sounds take on meaning? And that's the study of linguistics. So Noam Chomsky was a linguist. And what he was interested in, he, he completely disagreed with Skinner. And he wrote an, a famous article that said, B.F. Skinner and the psychologists have gotten language acquisition all wrong. They are primitive. There is no way that people learn all the complexities of language, human beings learn all the complexity of language simply on reward, on operant conditioning, reward and punishment schedules. Instead, Chomsky, a linguist working outside of psychology, he's not a psychologist, remember this, he writes an article and he says, instead, we have, human beings have something called an LAD, a learning language acquisition device. 
Now, we're going to study this next chapter in language and thought, but I'm just giving you the background story now so it may, helps you to make sense of where we're at with memory studies. He said, human beings have this mechanism in their brain, a, a mental processing called an LAD. It doesn't really exist. You can't find it anywhere. It's a theoretical concept. The LAD is the language acquisition device. It's something special about a human brain that allows language to be acquired. And he said that all humans have this ability for language to be required, but that depending on where we grow up, the gestalt, in other words, the, the, the um, context of where we grow up, the, um, the culture, what we learn, what we're exposed to, then our language develops culturally in a culturally specific way. So that is why someone growing up in France around the French language speaks French. It's also why someone growing up in Switzerland, where there are at least four different languages spoken from earliest childhood, have the ability in adulthood to speak fluently in at least four different languages, and often five different languages. It is also why in the United States, many of us have one language that we struggle with, because for some reason, and I don't know why, our public school systems still begin to introduce a second language in like seventh grade, long after the, the critical period has passed for language acquisition. Um, other cultures and other places in the world have figured this out long where we, where we lag way behind. And when you go to travel in Europe or if you meet friends who grew up in the European education system, you'll feel really kind of inadequate linguistically because they, they can speak French and German and English and, um, and, uh, and what other, uh, other languages they could be exposed to. And it's really something, so Chomsky's saying this happens um, naturally for human beings and it depends on what they're exposed to, but humans have this language acquisition device in the, as part of their brain. It's a, it's a processing capability unique to the human brain. How did, he, um, how did he come to this conclusion? Well, he has a very famous sentence. This sentence is semantically correct and syntact, I'm sorry, it's syntactically correct and semantically, who knows what it means. Colorless green dreams sleep furiously. Colorless green dreams sleep furiously. This is a sentence that's grammatically correct, but I have no idea semantically what it means. Syntax is the structure of the grammar. Semantics is the meaning. So colorless green dreams sleep furiously. And here, Chomsky used this as an example, where here we have a sentence that can be created grammatically perfect, but has no substantive meaning. He said that underneath all of this language acquisition, we have a universal grammar, that human beings have a universal grammar for language that underlies all other languages. And the way that universal language, that universal grammar expresses itself depends on the language we, we were introduced to in the earliest years and learned how to speak. Okay, why am I telling you this in a memory chapter? Because this, the work of Noam Chomsky, was cited as a criticism of behaviorism and Operant Conditioning in B.F. Skinner's book on language acquisition, and the work of George Miller at the Harvard Cognitive Lab also began to criticize the behaviorist's view of intelligence and how things were learned. And these two individuals, along with a few others, but these were the two real individuals that sparked something that we're in right now called the Cognitive Revolution. I think it's amazing that our switch from in psychology, think about this, think about this amazing thing. In psychology from 19, in American psychology from 1913 up and through the early 1960s, psychology was behavioral psychology, operant conditioning, classical conditioning. There was a revolution that ushered in the cognitive psychology. This is psychology based on the metaphor that the brain is hardware like a central processing unit. We have input and output. That's 
what we see, what we taste, what we smell, what we hear is the input. And what we say, what we, how we move, how we act, that's the output. Our behavior is the output. And in the middle of this, we have a central processing unit. It's equating a CPU. It's no longer stimulus response. There's something in the middle, organism, stimulus organism response. And this is why, as I like to say, if I offer you all opera tickets, some of you are going to be thrilled and some of you are going to be miserable because your organism, your processing in the, in the middle of this interprets the stimulus and then determines your response, whereas behaviorism was SR psychology. And this is the ushering in of cognitive psychology, the cognitive evolution. As you know from your first chapter, I guess nowadays about 80-some percent, I forgot what the textbook lists, but about 80-some percent of psychologists today classify themselves as cognitive psychologists. And you know from the first year studying, and first of them too, that cognitive psychologists use the what metaphor? Richard, what's the metaphor for cognitive psychology, the human mind and behavior is like a black computer. box? Like oh. computer. Black <laughs> box oh, behaviors. Oh, oh, oh. You got it, Omar. The, it's a computer metaphor. Take note. The cognitive revolution was ushered in by two non-psychologists. There's a theme here for those of you who like history, like I do. Who was one of the big figures who ushered in behavioral psychology who wasn't a psychologist? As a matter of fact, was adamant in his Nobel Peace, I'm sorry, his Nobel Prize uh, speech uh, to make a point that he was introduced as a psychologist and he was not, he was a physiologist. Do you remember who that was? Pavlov, who said you, holy moly, on fire over here. <laughs> yeah, Pavlov. So we had behaviorism ushered in by a non-psychologist. Now we're seeing the cognitive revolution ushered in by a non-psychologist and an artificial intelligence expert. That's my background story to tell you, not about language, which we're going to be doing, I think, next chapter, but to usher you into memory, which is a big part of cognitive psychology. So what I'm going to go over with you today about mem memory models is largely based on the information processing. Sounds like computer language, right? Everything you're going to hear today about memory sounds like a computer discussion, information processing, a computer metaphor. If I can remind you of this, the brain the nervous system, this is like a central processing unit. You all know what a CPU is, right? In computers, CPU is the big box that this monitor and the keyboard is connected to on a desktop. So the CPU is like the tower, you know? When we have a keyboard, and that keyboard on a computer, is a keyboard. That's the, where you input information. For human beings, input, or maybe the camera. You know, that's a camera. <laughs> input. How about microphone? This is all input. What are the equivalents of human beings? Eyes. Ears, microphones like an ear, typing information in. I don't. I guess that would be like reading or listening, perhaps. I don't. I don't know. We can't type. Maybe we have to touching as a way of input. I don't know. But this is all input. Now, when we have here is a monitor, which displays things. Uh, maybe you have speakers that play words or music. Maybe, I guess that's what we're limited to. Oh, printing, print out a printer. Might print sheets of paper out with text. This is all output. In human beings, what do we have as output? Speaking, that would be like speakers. <coughs> Writing, might be like a printer or, or visual monitor. Behavior, any type of behavior that's output. 
So we have the brain as the nerve, the brain and the nervous system is like a CPU. The sensory organs are like the input devices, and our behavior, either verbal behavior, body language behavior, written behavior, this is all output. It's a computer model model. Computer model. When input goes into the CPU, when you type something into the CPU, it gets encoded into computer language. Computer language is a series of binary zeros and ones. It's called binary code. Oh, thank you so much. It's called uh, encoding. It's called um, encoding. Encoding is when input is turned into, encoded into computer language. In cognitive psychology, we talk about input, encoding, and output. You might uh, think of this as observing, thinking, and behaving. <laughs> you know, input, encoding, and output. So I hope you're getting the feel now. Like there's a lingo, there's a language, and when you start hearing psychologists talk in language that makes human beings sound like robots, or that it has to do with computer science or has to do with artificial intelligence, or has to do with hardware or software, you know, it's safe to say, you're dealing with a cognitive psychologist. What would, what, so can you tell me, if I'd ask you, give me some keywords, what are some code words, so do we say, that would distinguish um, a behaviorist? A behaviorist. Uh, well, that's. Uh, I'm gonna say it again. A behaviorist. That last section. You're you're thinking cognitive, I think. Yep. Right. <laughs> so what about behaviorist? Would behaviorist be talking about uh, encoding? No. They would be using words like what? Observation. Observation. Uh, punishment, reinforcement, you know, all that kind of stuff. The stuff we talked about last week. Now, what are some code words? So think about code words. Because you hear people talking in reinforcement and punishment, and you say, ah, they're a behaviorist. And you hear about when you're in, you do get a professor next semester, and they start talking about language, and they start talking about psychology in terms of input and output, and encoding. And then you're going to say, ah, oh, this person is a what? Cognitive psychologist. You got it. Now, just for sake of fun, I wonder if you could guess if I'm up here and I start talking about the unconscious and your childhood experiences and your dreams and your relationship with your mother and relationship with your father, what kind of psychologist do you think I'd be then? Does that sound like cognitive to you? No? Does it sound like behavioral? Yeah. I'm going to say no. It sounds like something you haven't studied yet. It sounds like psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, Freudian psychodynamic psychology. See, every just because someone's a psychologist doesn't mean they're all talking the same language. <laughs> they can be talking different languages. I'm not a behaviorist. I know enough about behaviorism to teach you all an introduction to behaviorism. I know enough about cognitive psychology to teach you all about cognitive psychology, mostly because um, many of the courses that I had to take were cognitive psychology courses. It's just, you can't escape it right now. If you get graduate work in psychology, it's the, the dominant paradigm. So our memory studies are going to be largely based on cognitive psychology. You're going to hear a lot of computer talk. There's an interesting, an interesting thing I'd like to tell you, and that is, despite how, if you're like me, despite how tedious this is about to be for you, and this is, can be very, I remember the first time I studied it with a cognitive psychologist. And then I took a whole course in graduate school just on memory. I remember it was the first time. 
that I had to write a 30 page paper. The midterm was 30 pages, and the final was an additional 30 pages. So it was 60 pages, two, two 30 page papers for this. It was a master's level course. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my goodness, how, was, how could I possibly write 30 pages? And you know how I, <laughs> some of you have unfortunately lost a two page assignment? Because your computer crashed or something like that. Imagine that feeling when it's 30 pages and you have to start all over from the beginning. And that's when you get in the habit. I remember that was the deadline. It didn't happen to me. I was in the habit at that point of every time I, you can't sit down and write a 30 page paper at once. You know, this is something that unfolds as you're doing research and it takes, you know, seven weeks to get that 30 page paper written, researched and written and ready for presentation. And I remember every time I would add, say, a page or a paragraph, every time I could add something new to the document, I would save it, and I would email a copy of it to myself. Because that would mean if my computer died, it was always somewhere in, on a, you know, <laughs> an email account that I could access it again. And that's a good lesson to learn to keep cover yourself. Otherwise, you could find face with a tremendous amount of work that it might be impossible to recreate and then in trouble. So I remember taking a, a course from a, 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 a psychologist. And what I'm going to teach you right now became embedded in my skull. It became seared into my mind from writing that, those 60 pages in that semester. And when I went back, and I hadn't taught, I haven't taught this topic now in about five or six years, or maybe even a decade since the last time I've talked about this. And I was trying to think, oh, what memory? And it all came flooding back to me as I read the chapter. Um, the first thing he taught us is what I'm going to talk, teach you. There's a basic model. And remember, this is a model. This isn't true. Well, let me say it's true, but it's not real. There's no area of the brain that has the labels I'm about to tell you. This is simply a model that is based on a computer metaphor that contemporary cognitive psychologists use to understand and do research memory. And my guess is, my prediction will be that in 30 years time, this model will be a historical model and will it'll have progressed to something completely different or maybe somewhat different. But this model is simply how right now researchers go about understanding memory. And the model was laid out in 1968 by Two researchers named Atkinson and Shiflin. Atkinson and Shiflin. 1968. And it's called the Atkinson and Shiflin model of memory. <laughs> or information processing model of memory. So if I would say information processing, does your mind already does your mind already envision a computer? And I, information processing should sound like computer talk. And you know, ah, information processing, cognitive psychology, artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, computer metaphor. So the Atkinson and Schifrin model. 1968, so how many years ago? This is 53 years old model now. We're, we're, we're functioning right now on a, a model that was developed 53 years ago. There's other models, but this is, the, this is the, the one that you'll need to know for future classes. So now next semester you go into a class, I'll try to bridge, the, <laughs> you know, bridge it for you here. Next semester you'll go into a class, 200 level class, or maybe a 300 level class, depending on what you choose to take. And that professor is going to assume that when they say, okay, uh, based on the information processing model, you're going to say, oh yeah, I remember that from intro class. They're not going to think that they're going to have to teach you that. They're going to assume that I did my job and <laughs> introduced you to it. So then you keep your intro book and you might go back and look at it and refresh your memory and say, okay, that's right. Atkinson and Schiffman. And they could call it the Atkinson and Schiffman model like I was taught. They could call it information processing. Uh, Atkinson and Schiffer model identifies three areas of memory. 
And those three areas are called a sensory register, a short-term memory, also known as the STM, and a long-term memory, also known as an LTM. So you'll, you typically hear cognitive psychologists using terms LTM, STM, or sensory register and SR, but they usually say sensory register. Another term for short-term memory is working memory. That is one that came about in more recent years, working memory. So if you hear short-term memory, it could also, that's interchangeable between working memory. Again, be aware of the computer language going on here. Working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. Sensory memory doesn't sound too much like a computer. I'm going to first describe to you the characteristics of how Atkinson and Schifrin explain that this functions. And then I'm going to go in and exp uh, describe the specific experiments that were done, because this is scientific psychology, the experiments that were done to come to these conclusions. The first thing that Atkinson and Schifrin said and described was that we have an incredible amount of input coming into the sensory register. These arrows are input. Now look at all these arrows. I'm going to call this input. This input is all of the things in our environment. What we can see, what we can hear, what we can smell, what we can feel on our skin. It's all the sensory register. Now, interestingly enough, what Atkins and Schifrin didn't include in their original model, which I think is important to include, and it's laid, included in later models, is internal stimulus. I mean, right now, I'm up here talking, and there's other things going on. I, there's windows going on, like people walking by these windows that maybe you can't see, but I constantly see people walking and looking and what they're doing. Atkinson and Schifrin both said that all of the information that's coming into, that's coming into my senses, whether I'm paying attention to it or not, is available to me, at least for some period of time. Everything going on right now is available to us, even if we're not consciously attending to it, thinking about it. I'm going to tell you how they got to that, but these arrows signify all that's going on in our environment right now. And at least for a period of time, which turns out to be about a third of a second, we are aware of everything. But then after about a third of a second, there's only certain, there's only a few of these arrows that, that get in. And a few of those arrows, do you see how many less arrows, pieces of information, are entering into the short-term memory? These are things that we can have in our mind for about 15 seconds. It lasts about 15 seconds. And it's about seven plus or minus two chunks of information. I'm going to unpack that in a moment. Seven plus or minus two chunks of information. And that is the characteristic of the short-term memory. Sensory register, unlimited capacity. And it's about a third of a second in duration. So we talk in memory studies about duration and uh, capacity. Duration, capacity. Unlimited capacity, that means everything seems to get in according to this model. And duration, about a third of a second, about 300 milliseconds.
for the short-term memory, what is short-term memory? That are the things that we attend to. So right now, maybe some of you may, have, if I bring it to your attention, you may have just heard the mumbling outside, that there were people outside. But you're more likely to have been focusing on what I was saying and what I was writing. Now, what I'm saying and what I'm writing is the thing you're attending to, and attention is the big word. And attention is the thing that encodes, there's that word, that encodes this selected information into the short-term memory and is available for about 15 seconds, and it's about 7 plus or minus 2 chunks of information. So what is 15 seconds? Imagine this. If I say to you, I'll, you, you don't know this maybe, but years ago, we used to have the phones on the wall or on a stand somewhere, a landline, right? And this was before automatic speed dial and all this stuff. And you had these rotary phones, and you would dial this, and I mean, this is amazing, but I need this. This is what I grew up using. So you would have to, you say you want to order a pizza, you want to order Chinese. You would go to the phone book, look it up, and then look at the phone, 610-863-9678. 610-863-9678. 610-863-9678. And you keep that, and you go over to the phone, and you keep saying it in your mind, and you had to keep repeating it, because when you dialed this phone, it would take long for the, there was like a one, you, if you would dial like a one, it, you would dial it in, and it would take a while to get back to reset, and then you do a two on a rotary phone. I don't know if you guys have ever played with these, but they've seen them. So it would actually take longer than 15 seconds to enter in a number. And by the time you get to like the fifth or sixth number, you couldn't remember it. You had to actually write it down so you could then reference the thing. This is an example of how our short-term memory lasts about 15 seconds. And it's isolated to, to seven plus or minus two chunks of information. That means about seven numbers or you can order, organize numbers into chunks, data into chunks, such as if you say area code, um, local, and then the four digits of the phone number, so 610 or 215 or 918, okay, these are all three numbers that are, that's three numbers, that's one chunk of information. 863 is the next chunk of information, 9678 is the next chunk of information. You see, these are three chunks, separate chunks, and it turns out when we chunk information, we can memorize about seven plus or minus two. Between five and nine chunks is about our capacity for short-term memory. I'm gonna explain the, the research studies that found how this was found out, but right now I just want to describe it to you. So this is seven chunks in duration of 15 seconds. How do you keep this, you can have an, un, there's a way to keep things unlimited in your short-term memory, and that's if you keep repeating it over and over again. If you keep it, if you do rehearsal, repetition over and over, you would go to the phone book and say the number over and over, and you got to keep repeating it, keep repeating it, keep repeating it until you get to the phone, and then, you know, this is a way of keeping it there, and if you keep repeating it, it'll be there indefinitely. From the short-term memory, there's very few things that end up in the long-term memory. Laws long-term memory, the duration is unknown. Unknown duration. And the uh, capacity is seemingly unlimited. Unknown and unlimited. We don't know how, we know that in older age, certain memory stuff starts to decline. But usually long-term memory, if you have spent time with folks who are in their elder years, you'll notice that their long-term memory is usually excellent. It's their short-term memory that starts to fade. Uh, in, incidentally, this is something that I have, I, I know it's funny, but it's probably at like, I, if you're like 18, 19, 20, however old you are right now, it probably seems so far off, but it's a really amazing I promise you that during your 20s, you kind of think that's the way it's always going to be. And then in your 30s, which probably sounds a long way off for you, but it's not really that far off. It's, goes, it's, it's like right around the corner. 
um, in your 30s, you start to find little differences, but you're still pretty sharp. When I hit 40, 37, great around 40, all of a sudden, I, I became aware of really bad memory mishaps. Um, to the, to, I'll give you an example. This will, this will sound funny, but because it might sound like elder, like how it is when you're elderly. But what I found now in my life, I read. I probably have read in so far in my lifetime four, five thousand books. I would guess. Uh, I'm estimating th thousands of books. Um, I am now at a point where I'm mixing things. So in other words, I will I'll be talking about something, I'll be speaking about it with absolute authority, like I really know, like I was taught to speak in front of a classroom, like this is the way it is. And then I'll be confronted with the fact that I've taken two or three different things and mixed them all together. And my memory is very certain this is what it is until I research it and I find, oh my goodness, I'm saying the incorrect thing. And that started to happen to me, you know, around about 10 years, about 38, 39, I started to I realized, oh my goodness, I'm saying things that aren't correct. And then students would say, Professor Joby, this is what this says. And, I, and I'd have to, I'd have, it was humbling. I had to be, so I'm now, I do my homework to make sure I'm telling you guys the right thing. But I'm also a little cautious when I present information I'm just drawing out of the back of my mind because it could be, I could be mixed up. So this is something interesting that I found in my, in my, 40s, that my retrieval, the encoding was done properly, the encoding, but the retrieval, there's something wrong, there's something going on in the retrieval that's making things at times inaccurate. Actually, it's not such a bad thing. You might think, boy, what a, what a downer. Your memory's not as good, but do you know what I found? It's actually refreshing because... It, I think it made me a little more, I think it added humility, because <laughs> I've, I've been so frequently incorrect that now I'm a little more cautious, and when I present things, I'll say, I think this might be this, instead of saying, this is this, you know? And if I do say this is this, one of two things is happening. I either really did my homework, and it's fresh in my mind, or I'm making a big blunder. <laughs> I'm overconfident, but it taught me how to be a little less confident, a um, little more, a little more intellectual humility with that, which is which is not a bad thing. And you get, I think, as you get older. I don't know it's been my experience. It's you're kind of a little okay to be wrong. It's like okay, I, I messed up, and it doesn't. When you when when you're first starting out, like you, the first time you start teaching or you're in front of colleagues, you're terrified you're going to make a mistake because then oh, what are they going to think? And then as you get older, you're kind of like, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes errors. It's kind of it's not such a big deal. But nevertheless, we have retrieval, encoding and retrieval. It's unknown how large long-term memory capacity is, and it's unknown what the duration, how long it lasts. So this is, oh, there's an, in an interesting thing. Input, a lot of input in the sensory register. Uh, whatever we attend to in that sensory register, right now you're attending to my voice, or maybe you're attending to a fantasy, what's going to come next in your life, or maybe you're attending to a, a, a memory, what happened yet last night, or etc. And whatever you're attending to, that's what's going to get into your short-term memory. That's why it's so important, conscious, to pay conscious attention in, the, in your lecture and keep focused. Or how about when you're reading? When you're reading, all this stuff on the page is coming into you. And to really focus and, and be cognizant of these few things, that's what's going to get, that's what's eventually going to be rehearsed and get into and stick that you're going to need for your long-term memory when you need to recall it for a test or a lecture, something, a presentation you're giving. You know, you might give your research presentation, and then afterwards you, you open the floor to questions. And you're going to have to be prepared to answer those questions. Or, as I have learned, at least be prepared of where to direct the audience to try and answer those questions. That's another, it gives you a little bit of breathing room, you know. If, if I'm up here and, and the student asks a question and I, I don't remember, I'll at least be able to say, I would look into this, or I would look into that. And that's useful to 
to help people with their information. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second and see if there's any. Come on. Yeah, Um, I want to know. Did you say whatever you're attending to is going into your long term? Long term. The more you attend to something, you concentrate, that you are engaged with it consciously, that's what's going to go into your long term memory. Okay. Yeah. And there's some tactics, there's some skills, study skills of getting things into your long term memory. Which I'll tell you about. Uh, other questions? There's a little trick door. <laughs> this comes from psychoanalysis. The cognitive folks have picked up on it and they call it implicit memory. Implicit memory. And this is in contrast to explicit memory. So explicit memory are things that you consciously attend to and commit to memory intentionally. That's explicit. Here's the word. Explicit. Explicit memory. So when you're making flashcards or you're studying, reading a chapter and studying for your exam, or when you're reading the article and trying to concentrate and remember what it is you're going to have to write about in your assignment, or right now when I'm repeating two things that I've learned in the past, that's things I've committed to memory, and it's called explicit memory. But there's a lot of other stuff that you're going to remember in your long-term memory that you have no idea you're remembering. And you don't even know you know it. And that's called implicit memory. And somehow, implicit memory, I'm going to draw an arrow that goes like this. It goes directly from sensory memory to long-term memory without any conscious effort, without even concentrating on it. You might call it unconscious, implicit. It's knowledge that you don't know you have. It's a memory you don't know you have. You didn't commit to memory, but it's there. And I'll give you an example of this, and it's rather remarkable. Let's say we all bump into each other. Oh, we have class reunion, <laughs> introduction to psychology class in 20 years. I'll be almost 70. <laughs> You'll be my age, right? <laughs> Is that funny? Um, and and I say to you, class, how many of you can close your eyes? Oh, I don't know. And tell me what the sign said. The red sign said that's to. Well, it's not red. It's black. But this, what was there a sign effect? And some of you are going to be able to say. There was a sign up on the, the wall, and it said, the class gift of 1964 to, went towards the furnishings of this studio. Some of you, now you've attended to it, so now it's become explicit, right? But there's something in this room that, that got into your long-term memory that you're going to be able to know was there that you've never consciously thought about. And that's called implicit memory. That's pretty interesting. And I've done research on this and, and have evidence that this type of memory takes place. All right. So we'll lay all this framework down in the next lecture. Um, we're going to really put it in action. And I'm going to tell you how to use this to do, to be better memorizing. <laughs> to get better and uh, encoding and retrieval, encoding and retrieval. Okay, so the first question is, how do we know about a sensory register? How do we know that, um, how do we know that it's about a third of a second that we have everything in, available to us and the capacity is unlimited? Well, the two aspects that are researched in sensory memory are iconic memory, Iconic is visual, like visual, and echoic. Iconic and echoic memory. Iconic memory, I can tell you, is when you're when you're reading a, a sentence, 
And as you read that sentence, the words that you read stay in your mind for a period of time. And then you connect what you're reading now to what you had just read to make sense of things. Does that make sense? I mean, imagine if you didn't have the ability to remember at least for a half a second in your past, or a few seconds, you then would have lost things that came to, up to the point that you, you couldn't make connections backwards. When you're reading a sentence, you're constantly making reverses. Am I doing this in the right direction for you all? Oh, you're constantly making reference to the word or the concept that came before. When we're listening to, when you listen to my speaking, you're not only hearing what I'm saying at the moment, it's echoing, echoic memory. The, the words are echoing in your, they're lingering, the trace is lingering in your mind that you're constantly referring back to in my sentences. When we listen to a piece of music, the melody unfolds over time. Every note, as, as you're listening to it, you're at this note. And what comes next is kind of determined by your expectations from what came before and what you're used to hearing and what your culture is all about, as we learned, etc. So echoic memory is this period of time where everything that came into your hearing up until that point can still be accessed so that you can make sense of what's going on. Uh, everything in iconic memory is being able to view things and keep an image in your mind of what has just been seen so that you can make what you're seeing now in context of it leading up to that. Simply put, iconic memory is visual memory, echoic me memory is sound memory whether that sound is voice speaking words or music being played, whatever. How do we know that that iconic memory, everything that's presented either visually or acoustically to our ears is, is available for at least a third of a second? Well, an ingenious researcher uh, came up with a, a way to test this. And the, the research was done in 1960. I always say the coolest studies were done in the 60s. And I put, I'm going to show you how this is done. How do you know that everything is available for at least a third of a second? Well, a guy named Sperling came up with an iconic memory test. And I'm going to show you how this is done. If we have a series, he actually used four letters to my knowledge, but this example uses three letters. Three letters, three rows of three letters. And this information is presented to subjects for about a twentieth of a second, very briefly. It's flashed enough for you to see it, and then it disappears. And then the researcher is going to say, what was the bottom line? What was the middle line? What were the three letters of the top line? And by the time the researcher says, what was the bottom line, the third of the second's over. You can't, you can't recall it because it's gone. You see by the research that the, conf the compound, the conundrum is the, the time it takes to ask the person which line to recall takes more time than the memory trace is there. So Sperling came up with an ingenious idea. He said, I'm going to present 12, here it's nine, individual pieces of information to you. And I'm going to present all of this for about a 20th of a second. And directly after it disappears, you're going to hear a tone. And that tone is either going to be low, high, or middle. And when you hear that tone, recall what the three letters or the four, the three letters are of that line. If you hear a low tone, this is, a, this is the line you recall, middle tone. And this is how he found that after t the stimulus is, is over, and then the tone is played within a third of a second, you can access any of the information. But if it's longer than that, you can't. It's gone. 
And this is how the research showed that sensory memory gets everything in for at least a third of a second. So I know that's a little confusing, right? Is anybody here saying, what the heck is going on? Let's watch the demonstration. This is how it would actually be. This is how it would be administered to. This is a demonstration of how it would be done. So you look, there's the high tone, middle tone, low tone. So that's when you hear that. Keep your eyes in that center area where that center X is. It's just getting you familiar so there are no errors. Now here's the scent. This here's the experiment. <laughs> IEA was the low tone. I forgot DHI or DHJ. DHA. Are you all getting how Sperling did this study? What you need to remember for your next class and your next uh, studies in psychology is when someone talks about working memory. I'm, I'm sorry, strike that. When someone is discussing sensory memory. For this. When someone's talking about sensory register um, and they're talking it's a third of a second and the capacity is unlimited, the research is based on a guy named Sperling. So I would commit that to memory, Sperling, and this study of high, middle, low tones and random letters being presented to you. So, um, it would, I mean, memorizing that would serve you very well, especially if you're, say, you're, uh, for, for example, um, I work with musicians, and sometimes uh, students, adults, young people come in, and they're having great difficulty sight reading. Now, what does sight reading require? Sight reading requires that you're looking at a series of notes, and you have a one-liner musical note, and you have two liners. That's pianist reading two lines at once, bass clap and treble clap. Uh, a violinist is just reading one clap, or one line, a solo line, a trombonist one line. It's very difficult to, for one-liners to read two liners of music. You start, this is why it's always good to start out with piano and then play also another instrument, because then you're learning to read complex note sequences in over two staffs. You know what this looks like in music, the grand staff. You have all these treble clef, and then you have bass clef, and you might have a series of notes that you have to read all at once. Whereas if you're a violinist, you just are reading this. I'll get it next. Uh, you're just reading one series of notes horizontally. In piano playing, you have to read vertically, up and down, and horizontally. Now, can you see how sensory register, well, first of all, I hope you all can see now that when little kids grow up learning this, how, it, how much of an exercise it is in sensory register. This is why typically uh, uh, musicians, people who spend their life reading music and playing it, typically suffer fewer cognitive deficits in, in elderly years, 80s plus, because it's this constant exercise. It's like lifting weights every day at the gym. You're reading and you're constantly keeping your mind sharp with this kind of stuff. This 
in order to read this, by the time this group of notes moves on to the next note, that could be, depending on the tempo, there's a seven. Bump, bump, bump. That means every second and then you have to read ahead. So when you're on beat one, you're reading beat two. You get this? This is how sight reading takes place. So to be able to take in that amount of information in one second is and to teach this to people who, who or it helps you to know how to teach it so then you understand how sensory register works. If something goes too quickly, it may be, depending on that individual's processing speed, it might, there might be limitations on how quickly they can sight read, read by sight. Now, the more you rehearse a piece of music, so you rehearse it, it then goes in from sensory register, it then starts to go in the shorter you're concentrating on it, and it enters in the long-term memory, and that's when, you're, if you're a musician, you're playing a piece of music, and you've committed it to memory, and you know it so well that your body just plays it, and you can hold a conversation with someone and still be playing your music, because it has become committed into the long-term memory, into muscle memory, et cetera, things like that. So this is an example of how, at least in my professional work, this has been extremely useful. Um, sensory register, how do I develop Sperling's idea to get visual reading of more data in a split second. Do you know how I do this? I came up with a method, and I take flashcards. And on the flashcard, for when the students come in, firstly, the most important thing is you just keep every day reading new music. Not music you've read before, but every day you just sit down for an hour and you just read. You read and you make mistakes and you just read and read and read. That's, that keeps you moving ahead. But here's another way of tapping into Sperling's idea. Sperling. Uh, I make flashcards. And in that flashcard, I, there are a limited sequence of notes. I'll write this a flashcard in one beat, and I'll have, this is what's on the flashcard, like that, and I'll write this. Do you see this now? Any of you who are musicians, do you, you know this is a C major triad, C, E, G. So say someone's just learning how to read music, piano music, I'll take the flashcard, I'll put it up, and I won't sit it held holding it there like this so they can keep staring at it. You take it and you put it up like that. And watch this, you take a flashcard, you present it for what, a half a second, a millisecond. You have to start slower, especially with little kids, or it will become frustrated. So maybe you use a metronome, dup, dup, up. And then they say to you, C-E-G. And then you show another flashcard. What's the next flashcard? The next flash card might be this. DFA. And you're training their eye to not sit and put, but to just see the pattern and know, oh, when I, my eye sees that pattern, it's DFA. This is not unlike how you learn how to read. You know, when someone first starts to read, they, they see a, a word, D-O-G, and you go, D-O-G, dog, dog. But none of us read this way. We don't read letter by letter. We see chunks. We see those chunks. We see dog, dog. We don't have to spell it out because we've become so familiar with that. If we encounter a word we've never read before, it's like going back to beginner's language. We have to sound it out. We might pause and say, oh, and we might mispronounce it, etc. you know? So this is uh, just as an example for you how knowing about Sperling's research helped me to better understand how to present music reading to, to young people and to beginners of any age, not just young people. Okay, so you all know that I say to you, which research, who's the research, oh, let me put it this way. Sperling's research is related to which 
model, which uh, portion of the Atkinson Shipman memory model? Sensory register, short term memory, or long term memory? Sensory register. Good. What are the two types of sensory register memories? Long term memory. Well, the two oh, types of sensory, yes, no <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> the two, uh, wait a second, how is that? The two types of sensory register memories. There's two types. Iconic and echoic. Iconic and echoic. Visual and acoustical. Feel free to hear and see what I hear. But what about now, and again, what about stuff like this? What about touch memory and smell memory? We remember, we remember smell. Olfactory memory, tactile memory. It's not talked about in your chapter here, but I'm sure if you take a class in memory, you'll study it. You'll study it. Remember, somebody's researching it. I don't know. We have 10 minutes. Okay. Let's look at the next. That's all I'm going to tell you about sensory register. Let's look now at... Oh, there's something else I want to tell you about sensory register. Um, there's another researcher, not the person you think of. Darwin is his last name, but this research was done in the 80s. And Darwin did the research on the echoic memory, on the ear. And what he did was applied Sperling's model, but he reversed it. He played music and he showed visual cues of what to, to recall acoustically, and word sentences, recall this word. And he found basically the same thing, echoic and iconic memory. So know that that exists. It's probably easy to... How do you remember this? How do you remember Sperling? How do you do this? Repetition. And that brings us nicely into this. What do we attend to? What we attend to gets into the short-term memory. What we pay attention to, what we focus on. And the short-term memory lasts about 15 seconds, seven plus or minus two chunks of information. Uh, the seven plus or minus two chunks of information comes from research done by that guy at Harvard, George Miller. He wrote a great paper called The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. Had I not made the mistake of making your due date for your paper on Sunday, you would have been reading this article, The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. It is one of the coolest articles in psychology do you know how you read these articles and they feel very stiff and scientific sounding, a little dry? By the way, please don't write in this style for me. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I have a feeling that some of you are writing your assignments to kind of sound like what you're reading. You, that time will come for you. Right now, I would love it if you write as if you're writing to your friend who knows nothing about psychology and you're using simple language. Okay, so some of you are doing that very nicely. You're, you're reading the article and then you're just talking to someone. If you think I'm the person you're writing to, you're going to be writing over your head or over their head because uh, you're assuming I know stuff that. Uh, assume I know nothing. You write to your friend and use simple language. And um, remember, you can't use quotes while we're at this. Don't use direct quotes in your papers. Paraphrase everything. And paraphrase means put it in your own words. So I'm doing this to help you in the long run. To help you in the long run, the long run, the long run, um, I'm helping you now to read an article and process it and put it into simple words. I'm not going to tell you that, you know most newspapers are written at a sixth grade level, right? Most newspapers are written at a sixth grade level. New York Times isn't. That's written in at the college. But most newspapers you buy your local paper, it's written at a sixth grade level. Maybe think of a 12-year-old that you're explaining this to. And that's going to force you, you have to really, if you take a complicated, you get that you can quote an article and not really understand what it's saying, you just put the words in. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach, give you to be intellectually sharp, you know, so that you can take a complicated sentence and make it simple. So that's what I'm looking for in the paper, some simple life. Incidentally, this is a way of committing things to long-term memory as well. The, the processing, when you make this, when you take something and you work through it, you chew on it, and you, you really try to figure out how to make it simple, you're encoding that into your long-term memory. It'll help you to remember things. 
writing about something helps you process it. That's why cognitive psychology has to be a journal about your emotions and about your dreams and all that kind of stuff. Because it helps writing, the act of putting something into a narrative and writing into it helps to encode it, helps to process it and make it part of yourself. So George Miller found that, that throughout history, um, the, the number seven is significant. And you get about five to nine. Seven plus is two, minus two is five. Between five and nine, chunks of information seems to be what we can hold in our short-term memory. And um, this is why I would imagine everyone in here knows how their social security number by memory. And that's committed to your memory. It's in three chunks. Pa, 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 Three, two, four. That's the sequence. Telephone numbers are in three chunks. Chunk, one, two, three. Chunk, one, two, three. Chunk, one, two, three, four. Credit card numbers are in chunks. You'll see the numbers are chunked up into blocks of four. So it's usually between five to nine chunks of information that we can keep in our short-term memory for about 15 seconds. The study that's always cited to remember cognitive psychology is scientific, so these psychologists want to point to experimental research for everything. The research study that's pointed to for the seven plus or minus two is the George Miller study. Uh, which year was that published in? I forgot. 1956. I used to know. <laughs> oh, hey, by the way, since I'm doing this, tell a few birds with one stone. When you do your in text citations, don't forget your comma. Some people are not going to come. And I want you to be able to do it perfectly. Like that, the last name, comma, and then the period comes at the end, like that. But many folks, and this is just so you don't feel bad, I have 400 level students at Rutgers that are doing it, and I, I write to them, please stop doing this now. <laughs> They're putting the period over here, and that's not correct. If the period always comes after the, the reference. Okay. And no page numbers. Never put page numbers in. Page numbers are reserved only for direct quotes, and there are no direct quotes. Don't keep the keyword in here. Okay, so... George Miller, 1956. So if I say to you, if I ask on a test question, what is the capacity of the short-term memory? What's your answer going to be? What's the capacity of short-term memory? Duration. Uh, that's the duration. Capacity. I'm sorry, that's weird. Duration is time. Capacity is amount. So what is the capacity of short-term memory? Got it. And who's the researcher who, excellent, who's the researcher, someone else, who's the researcher who discovered this, document, gave evidence for this? You got it. <laughs> and if you're really sharp, you say 1956. And that's, um, this is, this is an aspect of psychology that uh, most students didn't know was going to be the case. And it's not the whole of psychology, but this is, you have to know this stuff. But if you go to master's degree, it's certainly a PhD, a master's degree, and your upper level classes, you're going to be required if you're having a conversation to back everything up that you say, or someone's going to say to you, what's your evidence? And you're going to look like you're going to be in front of an audience doing a debate, and they say, what's your evidence for this? And if they did their homework, then they say, well, according to George Miller, 1956, all of a sudden, you won. You can back up the evidence. And if you can't, you're, you're going to lose your, your ability. <laughs> you're going to lose your intellectual. How are we doing on time? We're done, right? Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> um, by the way, that, go off where you need to. I completely agree, but something shifted. I found a way to get excited about it. Like the moment that I figured out how to, that this was relevant to my life, all of a sudden it wasn't as miserable. And how did, what was my way in? 
like I said, how can I use this to help you to be a better teacher or be a better musician? Things that are important to me. So if you're finding this, anything teaches, always try to figure out a way to make it personally relevant to your life. Or say to yourself, one day this is going to help me to be a better therapist. And that'll, that should help you to, it won't be as much of a house. All right, everyone. See you next time. Thank you for your patience.